continuing on with our little art block, next up we have Joel Ryan, uh, also known as Microchasm, a 3D modeler for VR training simulating, uh, amateur game developer, one of the judges for a seven-day roguelike, which is uh, near and dear to many of us in the community, and also a Let's Player for SilQ and creator of the SilQ tile set. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Yeah. So... You can hear me okay? The uh, volume is good? Yes, I think so. Um, awesome. All right. Go for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Microchasm, and my talk is about creating the SilQ tile set. So uh, the first half of the talk is going to be about my experience with implementing the, the, the SilQ tiles, and the second half will be more generally my thoughts on uh, tile sets and, and tile design. But first, I wanted to give a brief introduction to SilQ. And in order to do that, I have to take one step back and talk about SIL. So uh, SIL is a roguelike based on Tolkien's first age, specifically the story of Baron and Luthien. The goal is to reach to the bottom of the dungeons of Angband and steal one or more Silmarils from Morgoth's crown. It has a deep character building system, a lot of different ways of playing. Uh, it has positional combat, uh, interesting intelligent monsters, and just an elegant design overall. Sil was developed by HALF, with significant contributions by Skada, with the first release on January 3rd, 2012, the anniversary of Tolkien's birthday. Uh, and the final release of Sil was in 2015. And then Quirk released the first version of his variant, Sil Quirk or Sil Q, in 2017. Sil Q continues the development of the original Sil, uh, with a focus on remaining true to the source material, um, making sure that all, that all items and uh, abilities are useful in some context, making Morgoth harder to kill, and rebalancing the game, among many other changes. And the, the release of Sil Q that includes the Microchasm uh, tile set is Sil Q 1.5, which was released on January 3rd, 2022. And so Quirk and I have updated the SILQ manual for 1.5, but uh, in the manual for the original SIL, the section who will like SIL looked like this, with the last sentence saying, the greatest obstacle to enjoying SIL will be its lack of graphics, but if you can overcome an initial reaction and begin to explore the world, your imagination should fill in the details more effectively than a small clump of pixels would. So this is where the title of my talk comes from. And I was kind of afraid that um, it would make me seem like I'm being contrary by naming my, my uh, uh, talk from this, but really I'm just poking fun at my own tile site because I think it's pretty accurately described as small clumps of pixels. Uh, the truth is I have a, a lot of respect for Half. He seems like an exceptional person, and he created a really wonderful game. And I think ASCII was just part of his vision for Sil. And this is what Sil looks like in ASCII. I think it looks quite good. This is what it looked like when I first started playing SilQ in early 2020. I was looking for a new roguelike to play, and right away I could tell that Sil was something special. Um, but at the time it was difficult for me to interface with ASCII roguelikes. I appreciate them now, and I've beaten Sil in ASCII a few times now. But at the time it was difficult for me, so uh, I thought I would check out the graphics option. And so he had a graphics option. I included it in this uh, screenshot. It says graphics not working yet. Uh, and it has it just because it, it's a variant of, uh, of NPP Angband, which is a variant of, of Angband. And so it sort of has this legacy tile code. And when you turn it on, it appears to work. But pretty soon you find that those humans in the middle of the screen are actually Tangle Thorns. And uh, that bat is actually an orc. And so I've always had this fascination with tile sets. Um, I think that there's a really interesting confluence of form and function. And I thought it'd be an interesting opportunity to just draw some tiles, uh, just as a, as a side project. So I opened the David Gervais tile set in Photoshop and started drawing my own. But pretty soon I found that I couldn't just draw tiles. Uh, there were some, some monsters in particular that didn't have any tile assignment at all. You can see there's this lowercase yellow D in the middle of the screen. It's supposed to be a creeping horror, uh, but it has just no tile assignment, so the game is defaulting to the ASCII. So I just did the best I could, and I drew tiles for about two weeks, and then I sent this screenshot to Quirk. And as it turned out, Quirk was pretty interested in having a tile set for his variant. And um, he just said if I thought I could finish 
drawing all the tiles that he would include it in the next release. So uh, all of a sudden I was um, uh, on this journey of, of being the Silk U tile artist. One thing I want to point out about this screenshot is you can see the, the player is this diamond shaped. It, it's supposed to be a stylized at symbol. And I had this idea initially that the tiles would be partially representational, but also partially symbolic, like halfway between tiles and ASCII. The, the spider to the left of the player is supposed to have an M shape because M is the, the ASCII glyph used for spiders and sill. That idea breaks down pretty quickly. I can't have all the monsters looking like their letters, but uh, that the idea of looking to the ASCII and thinking about what ASCII does well and trying to, to bring that into my tile set stuck with me. And I'll come back around to that at the end of the talk. Quirk, by the way, was an absolute pleasure to work with. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better collaborator, and I had a great time working on this with him. So I want to talk briefly about just a few of my, my influences. The first is the Oryx tile set. Uh, um, as used in Infra Arcana here. I think it's just a really successful, uh, simple, clear, representational tile set that, that leaves a lot to the imagination. I, just, I appreciate the, the clarity and simplicity of it. This is the Taffer font for Dwarf Fortress, this palette in particular. Uh, I really like the, the soft lines and the soft colors. It's desaturated, it uses a lot of grays. It has a cozy feel to me. And then this is Time Frame by Random Seed Games. Um, everything in this game has this overlay of geometric patterns, and it makes everything feel uh, cohesive, like everything uh, exists in the same world, but also, again, it has this cozy feel. Uh, it seems to me like um, uh, that it feels like everything is part of a tapestry. And so this is the Microgasm tile set. Uh, it's more complicated than, than the Oryx tile set, but it still leaves a lot to the imagination. Uh, it uses uh, desaturated colors and a lot of grays, and then the background has a lot of uh, re small repeating patterns. Uh, so yet, yet again, it feels cozy to me. Uh, it feels like you could run your fingers over the screen and, and it would feel like the threads of a piece of cloth. That's how it feels to me, at least. Uh, this is the Microchasm tile set. It's just over 500 tiles. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the process of impl implementing the tiles. So a big part of it for, for, um, for me was working on these two files, graph-new and flvr-new. These are the tile assignment files. There are 4,600 lines in total because Angband is an enormous game, um, has m many more tiles. And a big part of my work was um, figuring out which uh, uh, tile assignments were not used, which was most of them, uh, finding the ID numbers of, of monsters that didn't have one yet, like that creeping horror. Uh, and um, figuring out which things were assigned but were, were named in, uh, incorrectly because uh, they had the old Angban names and still basically uh, changes everything. Uh, it's an interesting uh, feature of Angban that it uses these data files. So uh, a lot of information about um, items and monsters, uh, where they appear in the dungeon, um, their attributes, their descriptions and names can be modified just by modifying text files. So you don't need to know how to program. So I was able to do all the, the uh, tile assignment on my own, which is excellent. The final files ended up being about 1400 lines. So uh, there were a lot of features of the ASCII that needed to sort of be ported over to the tiles because again, Sil wasn't originally created with tiles in mind. Uh, so the first one is monster awareness in the ASCII Monsters that are not aware of the player are displayed as a little bit brighter than nearby tiles. So the capital R on the left image, um, it's not aware of the player. We did sort of the opposite where we mark awareness using an exclamation point just because it's uh, unobtrusive up in the, in the top right corner. Most of this work is, is Quirk's work, uh, implementing this, uh, these features and, and me just providing a few tiles for him to work with. Rage um, in, in Sill in the ASCII is displayed by tinting the color uh, the, the colors of the monsters red, but we couldn't tint the colors of the tiles, so instead we just swap out the floor and, and, and wall tiles. Uh, similarly, um, glowing weapons are, are tinted blue when the type of monster that they're good at slaying is nearby, sort of like Sting in Lord of the Rings. So Quirk implemented a three-layer system where we have the floor 
the glow and then the um, the weapon tile. And that's how we sort of ported that uh, that functionality. Uh, it still shows damage numbers. Uh, when you do damage to a monster, it flashes the amount of damage on the screen, and I just drew those numbers as tiles, and then they get overlaid on the on the background. And then it was important to me to display the weapon that the character was was currently holding. I think it's useful to the player, and also just helps a bit with the role playing, um, uh, for me at least. Uh, but it turned out we we had only sixteen slots available per race to show character tiles. And uh, there turned out, turned out to be way more weapon combinations than I had anticipated. There are 89 total combinations in total. So basically what I had to do was draw 16 tiles that are somewhat ambiguous as to what exactly the player is holding, and then try to map all 89 combinations to those 16 tiles. And then finally, this, this idea of index color. So uh, as it turned out, Sil Q crashes in Linux unless the tile set is a 256 color bitmap. And this is one of those situations where adding uh, um, a restriction really improved the tile set because I was using way more colors than this. And this forced me to create a custom color table uh, to be really careful about which colors I was using to share colors across, uh, across tiles and to be aware of um, basically every pixel value because there are many, many cases where colors looked the same, even side by side, but we're off by uh, just a few numbers. So I think the, the tile set ended up being a lot more, more um, coherent and co consistent uh, because of this restriction. So I'm not going to talk too much about uh, ASCII and tiles. It's, it's a really big topic. It's an interesting topic. Um, if you're interested in making tiles yourself, uh, it's definitely something that's worth um, researching and hearing other people's thoughts on. Uh, Roguelike Radio episodes 51, 52, and 83 talk about ASCII and tiles. Um, Kizrati has articles on, on ASCII and tiles on his blog, and Mark Johnson wrote a paper um, on ASCII and roguelikes. All of them are linked at the bottom of this presentation. But I just want to talk about these two things. Uh, the first is classification. So in, in roguelikes, um, in ASCII roguelikes, as we know, uh, uh, an ASCII glyph doesn't normally represent just a particular monster, right? It, it represents a class of monsters. So uh, with the, the particular monster usually uh, being differentiated by the color. So if you see, let's say, a capital T, uh, even if you've never seen that particular monster before, you might know things about it because you're aware of that class of monsters and you're aware of the characteristics that that class of monsters uh, generally has. And this is something I think you can actually do um, in your titles, uh, not just in, in ASCII. And the other idea is association versus differentiation. So association is the is the issue with ASCII because every time you learn a new roguelike, you have to associate the the ASCII glyphs with new monsters, right? There's there's some crossover, but there's not really a standard uh, set of um, uh, mapping from from symbols to monsters. But differentiation is really good with ASCII, right? Uh, there really couldn't be symbols that are easier to differentiate than the letters of the, the language that you grew up with, right? In uh, English, in, in, in my case, and in many people's cases. Uh, in titles, it's kind of the opposite. Association uh, is easy. Um, if you see a red dragon, then it, you know it's a red dragon. Uh, but differentiation is more difficult, and so that's kind of where you want to put your, your effort in, in creating your tiles. Uh, th this concept of association versus differentiation is specifically from um, one of Kisarati's articles. So I'm going to talk a, a bit about tile set design and uh, my thoughts on so, some topics of, uh, uh, of tile design. So the first is silhouette. Um, when you're doing uh, a creature or character design, for any game, whether it's 2D or 3D, it's always important to have a strong and identifiable silhouette, right? But this is where I think you can do some classification in, in tile design. Uh, I think, you know, in a case where the player um, is in the middle of a battle, uh, maybe they're pressing their keys a little too quickly, right? We've all been there. That's usually how I die in roguelikes. And a new monster shows up in the corner of the screen 
you might be able to uh, really quickly know something about this monster, even if you've never seen them before, because you can classify them based on their silhouette. So if you see these, uh, a monster whose silhouette is, is um, dominated by spindly legs, then you know it's a spider, and so you know that it has a poison attack. Even if you've never seen it before, you know it has a poison attack. Or if it's sort of a hulking figure um, with uh, thick, large, thick arms, then you know that it's a troll and it has a knockback attack. So I think uh, a silhouette can be a useful tool uh, to to aid in in the player's um, recognition of, of monsters and make it a little bit more streamlined for them. If you try to keep the the silhouettes unique among groups. The concept of size is related to silhouette. It's pretty simple, just that the more pixels you use uh, to, to draw a monster, the more difficult that monster will, will be perceived as being by the player. It can kind of just be absolute, where your, your tiles get larger um, as the game goes on. Or it could be more relative, where uh, if a particular monster tends to represent a spike in difficulty, in the game, then you can use additional pixels to draw that monster to communicate to the player that they should uh, pay a special attention to that monster. And so this is uh, some examples of tile progression for, for my tile set. Uh, I have this inclination to just use all of the space that I'm given, right? So I, I initially I drew the Kribane in the, in the top right, or at the top left, sorry. Uh, just uh, enormous, right? I took up all of the available space. And some players even had a hard time recognizing that it was a Cribane. It's not really a traditional bird shape. It, it does have a strong form, um, but it's a little bit difficult to tell what it is. And it also over-represents the monster in the game. So I think that the tile on the right um, is more recognizable as a bird, still has a strong form, and does a better job representing the monster. And the same is basically true for the orc. I had used all of the vertical pixels to draw this orc, but it's one of the first orcs that you find in the game. And so I had nowhere to go from there, right? Uh, I couldn't draw later orcs as being larger uh, because this, this orc was already as big as it could be. And so I think that the, the one on the right does a better job representing the monster in the game. But also, someone on the forums pointed out to me that uh, the orcs in Sil are not the massive hulking Urukai of uh, Lord of the Rings, right? They're, these are the orcs of the first age, so they should be smaller. So that brings me to lore accuracy. This is a case where um, I, I had to draw some werewolves. And when I think of werewolves, I think of uh, humanoid wolf monsters, right? But um, it was pointed out to me that in Tolkien's mythology, werewolves are giant wolves that are inhabited by an evil spirit. So I had to redesign my tiles, right? Because honestly, a lot of these points boil down to the, the simple fact that instead of just drawing the tiles that you feel like drawing, you have to draw the tiles that will serve the player and serve the game. This was a hard one because I found wolves to be extremely difficult to draw. I think they might have taken more iteration than any other uh, uh, type of monster, and there are seven wolves in, in Sil overall. But definitely the game uh, in tile set was better for having done this redesign. Color is a pretty straightforward one. Uh, the, the the monsters with uh, a, a blue coloration have an ice branded attack, and, and with red color have have a fire branded. Uh, here, the the purple in the um, the second row represents uh, draining attacks, and I, I am using color as well um, for for classification. Uh, on the bottom row, that's a sort of nebulous group of horrors and nameless things. And they all have similar shades of purple to, to cohere them into a group. And initially, I had wanted um, the different Rauko uniques to have different colors. Rauko is the Quenya word for demon. So Valo Rauko is a ball rock. And um, there are a number of different Raukar uniques in the game, but uh, and I wanted them to, to have different flavors, right? Like smoke, ice, stone, fire, darkness. Uh, but the truth is that most of them are fire branded. Sil so sort of has this focus on uh, on fire. And so I had to draw the tile that would serve the game and serve the player. Uh, and similarly, this monster has a, has a whip. So 
I had to be sure to include that in the tile, which brings me to game accuracy. This is another example. Um, this is the cat, cat assassin. When I think of assassins, uh, I think of um, I think of them as having dual daggers. But I was playing the game one day, and it occurred to me that cat assassins don't have dual daggers; they have bows and arrows. So I needed to redesign the, the tile uh, again to to better serve the player and communicate to them the type of monster that they're fighting. So I had this uh, this concept of doing a, a black outline for all of my tiles. So every pixel uh, that had, had, had a color value would be surrounded by a black pixel. In the top row, you can see I'm just showing how, in many cases, I drew tiles to the extents of the space that I had. So there was no room for the, the black outline. And it doesn't make that much difference, honestly. In the bottom left, you can see what the tile looks like. Uh, in the game, this is Ungoliant. Uh, and you can't really tell that it's not surrounded by black pixels, but for the sake of consistency, I recently went back and made sure that every tile actually does have the, the black outline, except for on the bottom, uh, the bottom of the tile. And it just helps to pull the tile out from the background and differentiate the tile from, from nearby tiles. Mostly what I'm trying to say is if you uh, are planning on doing this for your tile set, keep it in mind from the beginning instead of having to go back and redesign your tiles later the way I did. Uh, and so I want to talk a bit about detail frequency. Um, I had this idea that my tiles would have uh, fairly low detail, and they would have these areas of flat color and these lines of a particular color that would help to differentiate them. So in the top left, you can see one of the dragon tiles on a featureless background. And in the bottom left is that same tile on a noisy background. If you squint your eyes, you can still see the tile. In fact, I think it stands out a little bit more from the background because of those areas of flat color and those lines of color. In the top middle, I've artificially added detail to the tile by adding some noise. And in the bottom middle, you can see it does still stand out from the background, but mostly because of the black outline. And then in the top right, I remove the black outline and in the bottom right, it really blends into the uh, to the background. And uh, I'm definitely not saying that you need to use uh, a noisy background and low uh, detail tiles. I'm just saying that it's something to keep in mind. If your tiles and your backgrounds have the same level of uh, detail frequency, then they can blend together. Overall, for, for all of these points, um, I'm not really saying that you should do uh, make any of the decisions that I made, right? I'm definitely not an expert on tile design. Uh, I'm just a, a guy who made some tiles, and I'm trying to bring up some things that I thought about when I was making them, and things I think might be useful to you think of, uh, for you to think about. So this is what the tile looks like in the game. The background has these little pixely details, and then the tile itself has those areas of color that help it stand out, as well as the black outline, uh, the brightness, saturation, color, that sort of thing. And the, the areas of color and lines of color uh, bring me to the um, this point, which is about major forms. And this is the closest tie back to the beginning of the talk, where I was talking about looking at ASCII and, and seeing what it does well, and trying to bring that some of that into my tile set. So I thought, uh, although it's impossible to have symbols that are more easily differentiated than ASCII symbols, at least my tiles could uh, have these major forms where if you played the game enough, you would start to see these forms almost like symbols. And so in the middle, I've called out the major forms of the tiles as I see them. And on the right, I've drawn them as if they were like pen strokes. So here's an example of the progression of the idea of major forms in the tile set. So on the far left is one of my early attempts at drawing Morgoth, and has a lot of little pixely details. It's highly likely that any particular pixel will have a neighbor of, um, of different values. It looks uh, just sort of muddy to me, and a bunch of tiles like this next to each other would just blend together. But as it progresses, and especially the tile on the far right, it has stronger major forms, especially across the chest 
the head, the weapon, and the leg on the right. Uh, the black outline helps it stand out from the background. And it's just a more sil solid and differentiable form overall. So I wanted to talk a little bit about tile perfection in general. So this project took uh, almost exactly two years from when I first started drawing the tiles to when 1.5 came out. And uh, I feel like when you work on a creative project, um, you build up these resistances over time where there are things that you know need to be done, but maybe you spend a lot of time, say on those werewolf tiles. I don't really like the, the initial werewolf tiles, but I did spend a lot of time trying to get them to look good. And then all of a sudden I realized I have to throw away all that work, right? And so the way that this project went, because you know it's a side project, you can't really do this if um, if you're being paid or or this is your main job. But because it's a side project, um, I could work on it for some weeks or months and then let it go for for some months, sometimes many months, uh, and then I would get back to it. And when you do that, even if you just let it go for a few days or or a week, um, a lot of those resistances uh, erode and you can come back in with a new perspective and do the things that you know need to be done. Uh, and um, a lot of the time, like, so so for this, this tile in, in particular, uh, I don't think that the tile on the far left is really especially effective. Everything is sort of at the same level of importance. Uh, it, it's not got interesting color choice um, the proportions are a little weird, the pose is kind of awkward. And as it progresses to the right, and especially the tile on the far right, the, the color choice is more interesting. It calls out certain points as major forms. Uh, it has more depth recedes into the background. And has a more striking, interesting pose. It's actually one of my favorite tiles in the tile set. Uh, and, um, you know, I found that... Uh, uh, it was almost always beneficial to redesign the tiles. And almost every time that I redesigned the tile, it got better, right? just because I was getting better. Um, any type of creative work, it's kind of like playing a roguelike, right? Sometimes if you die in a roguelike, what you need to, need to do is think about what you learned and remember that it's you that's improving, right? So if you need to throw away part of your creative work, just remember that when you're making something, you're not just making that thing, right? You're making yourself into the person who can make that thing. And so uh, as long as you're improving, that's what matters. However, uh, there's also this issue where if you spend too long making little changes, I like to call them little noodly changes, uh, you can end up nudging the work in the wrong direction just slowly by making these little little changes. It reminds me of when I used to do a lot of wheel thrown pottery. And if you spend a lot of time trying to get the wall thickness just perfect, in reality, you end up introducing a lot of little imperfections in the wall thickness that weakens the structure overall. And the more you work the clay, the more you misalign the clay platelets that had been stacked on top of each other. And so again, you weaken the form overall. And so one thing that I do with my creative projects is uh, I keep backups of the work along the way. And I go back and compare my, my tiles or, or whatever it is uh, to older versions. And most of the time, it's just a, it's helpful from a mental health perspective to say, uh, like, look how far I've come. You know, the new ones are so much better. Uh, but sometimes you look back at the old ones and you say, hey, like, the old, old one is better because I made those little changes and I nudged things around and, and the tile sort of degraded over time. Uh, sometimes the whole tile is better. Uh, sometimes it's something more like um, the color scheme was better. Uh, and sometimes it's really small, like, you know, the new tile is the better one, but that left leg in the old one was better. So let me pull over that left leg. That's a hell of a left leg, you know. Uh, and then you know, combining them makes it better overall. Uh, but yeah, as I said, I, I don't think that the tile on the far left is really especially good. Uh, and I'm kind of showing it just to say, you know, if you're interested in making tiles, um, you don't have to be an expert, 
right? Like, I don't think that it took any background in pixel art or, or an illustration to draw that. Uh, it can be difficult when you're doing creative work to feel like the work you're doing isn't good enough. Uh, but I think it's helpful to remember that, first of all, basically everyone who does creative work feels that way. Uh, so you're not alone. Or at least they felt that way for a long time. And also, that feeling that your work isn't good enough is kind of a double-edged sword. Because on the one hand, it, it can kind of weigh you down and prevent you from enjoying the work that you're doing. But also, yeah, knowing that your work isn't good enough is kind of your greatest asset. Because it means that you've got style, right? Ira Glass would say that you've got, you've got taste. So you can use that feeling that your work isn't good enough to just sort of generally guide you towards what you end up, uh, uh, what your style ends up being, even if you don't know what it is yet. That's excellent. Uh, yeah. I, Sorry, I'm, I'm just showing up to let you know that we're hitting time. Not that I want oh, to interrupt these. Oh, I'm, I'm, I've got uh, just a one, one, one or two slides left. Uh. Okay, I can I can just uh, go ahead and show these are uh, these are the links uh, to some of the things I mentioned in the talk. Okay, excellent. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Which I mean, fantastic stuff. And I, I love also ending on kind of those bigger mindset notes about approaching art and approaching this kind of work. On top of I think just a lot of really specific details. Like I think I, I love that detail frequency uh, kind of uh, putting it on top of a noisy background. Um, yeah, just fantastic stuff. Um, thank you. Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, I hope that maybe that slide of links we could get uh, share that somewhere for people. Um, yeah. And then uh, if you're around or if you know people want to discuss more about this in the Mage breakout room, then they can do so. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. So excellent. All right. Um, yeah. That was really fantastic. Uh, it, it's nice to have some so th some of those art conversations, and I like the contrast. If we went, you know, three D, very modern, and then tile sets, very traditional. It's great. Bit of something for everyone.